just gonna say thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you guys enjoyed the conversation with Dan. I hope this is going to be a bit of a conf uh, continuation of it because we're talking about AI data, ethics, things that you're all very, very familiar with. So my guest for everyone that's watching is Anthony Peake, CEO of Intelligent AI. Hi, Anthony. Arthur van der Fort, researcher at the University of Exeter. Hello, Arthur. Nemo de Krill, CEO of Sigma Polaris. And Robert Hillier, who is just back from the G7. He's a communications expert and Tribe Tech podcast, and I'm sure you've just seen also my husband. So as you can see on the screen there, my name is Fiyaza Khan. I'm a journalist, podcaster, and social media consultant. Just so you know, there's a 20-minute networking session after this. So just click on the left. You'll be assigned to someone to speed chat to. Super, super fun way to get to know people who are in here at the moment. And I think we should get right into it, but I'm just gonna do a quick housekeeping reminder. Um, just keep yourself on mute unless you wanna speak. If And if you're in the audience, I'd love to take your questions, but just type them in the, sh uh, in the chat for this session. Um, and the only reason I want you to be on mute is because sometimes we get feedback or I can hear like um, sounds and I, I don't want to. But anyway, let's he uh, hear from Arthur first. Like, you've conducted research into how AI and data science can be used to understand human systems. Now, obviously, that's going to be quite detailed. I would love to know more about it, but briefly, if you can, <laughs> is that possible? Yeah, of course. So really, um, my research focuses on this key dynamic, which is sort of a, um, you know, key element of AI research is, of course, you know, the data deluge or the data revolution, this sort of massive explosion, in the amounts of data we have available from different sources uh, that enable us to train really sophisticated models and also access new dynamics that we couldn't previously do. Of course, this territory comes with a lot of questions, right, uh, around representation, right, around um, around the, whether or not people can give consent to being tracked on that scale. We're talking, of course, about, for example, Twitter data, your Facebook browsing data, your TikTok preferences, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this has enormous potential, which we cannot ignore. But in order to integrate this stuff meaningfully into a toolkit where we study people, which is really the potential of this, we're not studying star, star systems, we need to be able to sort of understand the ways in which um, new uh, digital trace data creates you know, uh, new inequalities, uh, the ways in which digital trace data represent reality and ways in which they don't, right? Do, for example, Facebook data represent a social reality? If you check someone's phone billing data to uh, look at their mobility, is that a one-to-one -one comparison? Where are the differences and who's represented in those differences or not? And that's what my research focuses on a little bit. Um, so the key thing is that the differences that exist are never random, right? If we think about who's represented in data systems, right? Data systems are a reflection of their society, of course. They're a reflection of a constant curation process, a co constant curatory process where we say what we value and what we don't, what we want to keep for posterity, and what, which, what we want to discard. This is something that's baked into the knowledge we produce, right? And so when we have data-intensive systems, this is a legacy that gets carried with it. So, of course, one example is if we have, for example, uh, gender disaggregated data, that's a binary gender disaggregation, right? Whereas it might be more complex than that. And the people that tend to fall outside of those simple categories are ones that tend to be more marginalized, right? If we're looking at phone data, for example, and how that reflects mobility, people who don't have phones, people who share phones, etc., are non-normal or non-standard user categories, which tend to be the ones that are also the most disadvantaged or the most marginalized. And so how do we incorporate that into the way we research like this? And yeah. Oh, uh, well, uh, Anthony, do you have any experience on that? I mean, how, how do you um, manage data uh, or putting out data in that way when you're dealing with, you know, people who are non-binary, for example, or people who are um, sharing phones or, or sharing computers? And how, how does that work? So. So intelligent AI is, a, is an insure tech, and you know, we're, we're bringing together 300 different pieces of data, satellite data, open data, IoT data, open, you know, all, all sorts of different sources of data to identify risk. And I was, I was inspired um, to form the company from Grenfell Tower. You know, 79 people died. It's going to cost the insurance industry over $2 billion. There's carcinogenics in the ground for a mile around. Other people will die from cancer. So... Yeah, we need to find good ways of using data to prevent those things. Um, in Grenfell Tower, half the people didn't have insurance. The other half, it would be cheap goods. And therefore, from an insurer's point of view, there'd be no risk. I've not seen any claims. There is no risk. And yet um, the fire service had 15 call outs in the year leading up to the fire. 
and none of the insurers were tracking fire service data. So the way I tend to look at this is, you know, we've been working for the last year uh, together with the Digital Catapult, a government agency that's looking at AI and data, but also looking at the ethics of AI. I naturally assume that data is biased. You know, the more people in an area, the more crime there will be. It's not because they're, they're more criminal, it's because there's more people. You know, they, there is more crime reported outside a police station, and police stations were often positioned in underprivileged locations in the past. And therefore, it makes out that there is more crime in those underprivileged locations. So I, so through the ethics framework we've developed, we've been, we've been starting from the point of this data will be biased. And how do we view the data both with the bias and without the bias? And then how do we communicate the bias to the people who use it? And so, so I think there's a, there's a lot of good in what we can do by bringing the data together, but we need that ethical framework. So that's interesting because Anima Krill from Sigma Polaris um, was on the Tribe Tech podcast and we talked about um, data ethics and we talked about um, how to ensure that, you know, AI doesn't take on human biases. So Nemo, talk to us a bit more about what you told us on the Tribe Tech podcast, because I think actually it was quite interesting. I'm glad you enjoyed it, uh, Fiasa. Um, so I think both of what you're saying, Arthur, and what you're saying, Anthony, really resonate strongly um, because there will always be bias uh, because anything uh, makes that, that wants to do fast and good decision making first needs to make an abstraction. Whether that's a human that makes an abstraction or an algorithm that makes an abstraction, it's a simplification of decision-making sort of variables you then decide to act on. Any simplification will have errors, and those errors are what lead to bias. Sometimes there will be ethical biases, uh, also for everyone's for me, I'm non-gender, and then sometimes it'll be related to gender. Sometimes it'll be related to not factoring in fire engines being called out, because you only factor in so much information. And at Sigma Polaris, and I'm not going to do too much detail with what we're doing, but we're taking a human error and we're trying to replace it with a piece of algorithm. And the things you then need to be very careful about are the processing elements, which are easy, and then the other sort of is, which is the data elements. Because for instance, if you end up factoring in a binary uh, a gender identity into something like that, you're gonna end up having some very, very big errors. Um, and what we were speaking on, uh, Fayasa, on the Tribe Tech podcast was how a lot of the times the algorithms might not actually be biased, but they work on, a, on an, an abstracted model and on a piece of data that will train them to be biased because they will make errors. And everyone does errors. And what we then need to do is try to understand those and refine them. Do that. How we <laughs> ensure that that could be, I mean, I, I suppose we're quite early on in this um, area so you know yes it's quite early on, but how do we move forward and how do we ensure um that this that that, that doesn't happen that human biases do not i mean anthony or Nemo, whoever well, I, might, I might start one way of doing it is when you make the model you start with the abstract case and you start using it and you see if the work but what you can do is then go in and test it by looking at the end result and see if the end result has some of the errors that you're trying to avoid. You cannot necessarily correlate that straight into why that's the case. But if, for instance, you find out, like say the Amazon algorithm was over-selecting females, no one knows why that happened, but it knows that it happened. Then they can go in and look at the processes. If they cannot find an error in the process, they can then assume the error is going to have to do with, with the way the data was being screened. Uh, so, so looking at the end result and see if you have an error there is sort of a way of testing if maybe your processes or your data management is incorrect. So just keep testing and checking. Anthony, you... Yeah, no, I think it's I think it is always important to go back and look at the original story. Even if you read a news story, go back and, and sometime later and read what the follow-up... There were some students in America um, wearing MAGA hats who were supposedly ups, you know, uh, upsetting and bullying some Indians, um, Native Indians in America. When you went back, actually, there were some provocations that were done not from the Native Indi Indians, but from other people. And often those stories are completely biased. So I think it's always, yeah, when you look at the use of CCTV cameras and AI uh, for the Notting Hill Carnival, there were some early headlines saying 34 you know, bad people were captured uh, by tracking all of this. Actually, when they went back and looked at the data, um, I think there was one person um, ultimately who was found guilty of something. The rest of it was incorrect data, 
misprofiling, etc. So I think whether you're whether you're looking at bias in data and risk management, and you know, are they are you looking at fire systems and fire data, or whether you're looking at news stories and how algorithms work. I think it's it's up to all of us to go back and and re review that story sometime later, um, and be able to check that actually all of this stuff starts off being biased. We're humans and we fail. Um, let's let's take that for granted in the in the ethical framework. And then I suppose the question, Arthur, is sorry, is this too big? Like, can we monitor this? Is is it too much for us to do? Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think I. Nicely with um, what I want to say is, um, yes, it's too big in the sense that I don't think we can ever truly de-bias an algorithm. What does that mean, right? Um, and I draw a lot on data justice work here, which I think is a really interesting and important uh, way to approach bias, because that's the question, where do we locate bias in data intensive work? And so uh, two key authors here, because we were asked to cite, is Joy Bolamwini for the Algorithmic Justice League and Tim Negebu are two sort of really leading people in this field that are really good to draw on. The question is, right, is the bias, is the bias really in a technical problem or is it a societal problem? Um, let me ask the question, for example, a facial recognition uh, algorithm that we can perfectly de-bias, but we apply in the US where, you know, communities of color are, you know, consistently over-policed and this algorithm is used to do that, right? Is that a racist algorithm? or not? And I think the question we need to ask here is how do we address these issues and how do we address this problem? The data justice movement argues that, you know, forget about the algorithm because you won't ever be able to de-bias it. These problems will always keep coming up. And instead, we need to understand that we as data workers are political actors and that the solution to this very often is political. And so, for example, the Algorithmic Justice League with uh, regards to uh, facial recognition software in the US has lobbied hard and successfully now for Congress to ban uh, put a full moratorium on the development of, as you know, uh, facial uh, the application of facial recognition software in government um, um, enterprise. And so that's a huge thing. And I think that is a lot more uh, for sort of social justice and ethics than trying to de-bias facial recognition software ever will. And so I think that's a really good way to approach it. And, and I think that sort of gets at the bigness of it because it's a societal thing, not a technical thing. Nemo, do you have something to say on that? Because I, I think you probably disagree. Uh, well, I, I largely do agree, and, and uh, actually, um, I, I have some things I disagree with, but several I also do agree with. I think most importantly, um, I, I think there is a really big difference between uh, finding a bias and finding a consequence of a bias. Uh, and I'll use the states as an example. Uh, we all know, for instance, you, you uh, brought up uh, like sort of with the college communities uh, and how there is an awful lot of problems from you know, educational level upwards there. Right, absolutely, uh, and that will lead to an awful lot of consequences. Uh, and you might pick up on some of these consequences, but anyone, for instance, that will say that uh, a, a person of color is less likely to commit a, a gun crime is simply incorrect statistically. Now, that doesn't mean this has anything to do with color. It's a consequence of a societal bias and prejudice throughout generations. But here is an example: like facial recognition is a massive topic, and I love it. But but. But an example of, of how this could come about, and this would not be in these cases you're describing because there's some big issues in those specifically. But if you had cameras equally well distributed in an entire city and they picked up that some, some demographic, any demographic, religious, ethnical, whatnot, age, was more likely to do something, then that would not be a bias necessarily. Um, it could simply be that they are more likely to do it because various pressures stemming from other biases. So this would not be the algorithms being biased, they would pick up on a societal bias. And this is one element I think people often fail to recognize, for instance, with facial, uh, facial recognition, is whether it picks up a societal bias or whether it's, uh, it is bias itself. I mean... We're in the process of, of developing a, a, a pilot with a new insurer at the moment where we're building digital twins of, of 20,000 global locations, 300 pieces of data to identify risks at those locations. And the interesting, for me, the interesting thing for me is that I'm starting off by looking at the insurer's existing data, right? Pre-AI, pre-big data, the standard stuff that clients give to brokers, brokers give to insurers, right? That data is faulty and biased. 
quite often it will show large companies to be less risky, small companies with a single location and a small premium to be more risky. Large companies have ways of using their data to be able to then retell that story um, and present themselves in a better light. Smaller organizations don't, and they don't actually understand the process of how actually people are making decisions on my data. How do I interact with that? So actually part of what we're doing is bringing together real data and challenging that data and being able to identify that actually those smaller companies are less risky than some of the large companies. And those smaller companies are doing social good as well as commercial good. And therefore, how do we calculate that into the, into the algorithm? So I think a lot of the existing data is biased and a lot of the manual processes that people go through leave that bias there. I actually see the benefits of AI and, and big data as allowing us to bring together a lot more data to, pr to prove or disprove those biases. So is there any way then to eradicate unconscious bias or is it simply not possible, Nemo and, or, or Arthur? And why not if it isn't possible? I think I would be really cheeky and ask a meta question here a little bit, uh, which is because no matter what, the algorithms will have bias. Sometimes it'll also be positive bias. Let's recognize that you can over calibrate them in any directions, but they will never be perfect because it's an abstracted model. I would just say facial recognition, okay, it is so awful, but maybe it is better to have something that makes a systematic error that we try to, to adjust than say put a, a, a human on every street corner and have them judge people based on how it seems. And the one thing I'm bringing up here is algorithmic bias is something dear to my heart and it's so important that we, we take care of it. But human human error is, is uh, woefully large and I would say the moment an algorithm does significantly better than humans, it might be a good time actually to switch over to that and try to improve it. Because improving humans, we have tried to do for you know thousands of years. And uh, personally, I'm not impressed. <laughs> uh, what, what do you think about this, Arthur, academically speaking? Like, you know, because like, it is a data justice question, really. Like, you know, when we change over, it's like, and, and it goes into, you know, uh, automated vehicles and so many other things. But I think the moment we start getting significantly better than humans in the bias front, we don't stop working, but I think maybe we start using a different approach. What do you think? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, so it's an interesting question and there's no right or wrong answer here. So I'll just describe the approach that I tend to, to take with, uh, with this kind of stuff, which is that, um, yeah, human error is a thing. And I don't think algorithmic work ever eliminates that, right? People still make algorithms. And of course, this is something you describe as well. That's how bias gets into these algorithms. Um, the problem is, right? Everything we do to judge the quality of an algorithm, to 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 um, to develop an algorithm and to apply it, etc. Right? Everything there is a consequence of of, of sort of interpersonal relationships, right? Uh, and 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 societal bias creeps in at that point. What is a better algorithm, right? We're making a lot of big choices about what we think is good there, which is fine, right? That's what people do too. I don't think algorithms do that particularly better. So the thing I think we really need to be aware of when we apply algorithms, which I think I don't want to be a Luddite, and I think we need to have a balanced perspective on this, is that we need to be able to understand that when we, uh, that we, we, sorry, we need to be able to distinguish a better algorithm, a better process from an instance where, you know, we've got human biases, but we sort of dress it up in this empirical scientific you know, uh, front, if you want to call it that, and and therefore say this is more reliable, this is more this is more uh, unbiased or objective. Whereas really, this is just an automated way of being of of perpetuate, perpetuate, perpetuating sorry uh, inequalities. And so I think that's the, the sort of key difference that we need to uh, be aware of. I think um, a book by a author which I forgot, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. I'll find the author for you. In a moment is an interesting way of approaching this of course it's pop science and and has a lot of issues in and of itself as well but it describes a societal dynamic that i think is important to name especially as we move into applying ai and machine learning in general at a large scale where these issues will start becoming more and more prevalent i mean so sean asked when would we get to a point when we're certain that algorithms are doing better than humans and that 
I think is quite an essential question. Anthony, do you want to take that one? And then Nemo. Yeah, I, yeah, it's key to me. I, I'm, I'm seeing opportunities every day where the technology can deliver good benefits, often at the edges of, of where humans are. So, so in the last conversation where, where there was quite a lot of negative discussion around technology and the, and the technology market, and yes, there are lots of negative things, but there are benefits. You know, I talked about the use of 3D printers for printing arms for, for children. Um, and crowdfunding, those sorts of things. I talked about local councils using AI-enabled chatbots during the pandemic to be able to service a community. Um, I often sit down with, let's say, a social care team, and, and, and they will say, we could never use AI. It's too much of a human, a human um, interaction. And then I say, do people phone up asking to buy an item that they could have bought on Amazon, and you have to spend time on the phone telling a, a carer how they can buy a, you know, a, a urine bottle or something like that, when actually that could be done by a computer much better, much faster, a much easier journey. Give them the link to where to buy it, et cetera, um, and free up the social care team to be able to work with people. I mean, in the, in the insurance space I'm in, um, the, you know, the whole industry – is, is very much looking at how do I process data and then make a decision. Um, it's not looking at how I reduce risk, how I help with health and safety, how I help with business continuity of organizations. I often say 80% of everything we do as humans is admin. You know, moving numbers from one Excel spreadsheet to another or from a CRM system to, to something else. And we get less than 20% of our time to add value to our companies and our customers. So if the systems can are open if the if the algorithms can be interrogated and audited um, they're not black boxes they haven't just learned through deep learning and we don't understand them as long as we can audit them we've got an ethical framework when the system can move faster than than humans can and they can free up people from that 80 percent of admin so that they can focus on helping companies and and large apartment blocks and and these sorts of things um, reduce the risk, then I'm, I am in favour of that as long as we have the ethical frameworks. Yeah, absolutely. I think chatbots definitely take up so much, I mean, they take away so much time or give us back so much time. That's amazing. Um, but like you say, we, we definitely have to have the ethical framework. Nemo, you wanted to add on that? Yeah, no, it is. I just strongly agree with uh, what Anthony is, is saying. Uh, and I, I just want to elaborate on one of the things, which is an, an AI is, is just an algorithm. And sometimes we make the distinction that we, we uh, mix algorithmic uh, ethical considerations with AI algorithmic considerations. And what I mean with this is, say, my other half, I cannot say exactly what they were working on, but they, they were, it was related to data science uh, inside with COVID. And they managed to automate away manual process of two of their colleagues, meaning that they freed up two more people to do valuable work to get us insights. That is, there was no AI involved, but it was putting an algorithm in place. And obviously this adds value exactly in the way that Anthony is saying. Sometimes this is an efficient statistical algorithm you put in place. And sometimes we call those, depending on like AIs, depending on, on the structure of them. Um, we don't necessarily need to be scared of them. Sometimes our fear is just we replace a human, but that gives a lot of freedom that we should remember. And, and to the other half of your initial questions, Fiasa, um, Again, we can look at the end results. Uh, and this was uh, Sean's initial question of how do we know if, if it's actually better than humans? And a lot of the times we don't really know that something is broken until you know, we discover it, it's, it's broken. Um, and then we decide to put an algorithm in place. And we can then go in and use a similar method to see is it still broken? And uh, an example close to heart would be uh, like we all, uh, some of the most famous uh, AI failures have to do with the CV analysis, for instance, where they turn out to become awfully, awfully biased so quickly. But you know that because of the selections they do. But if you then could look at the selections they do and determine, actually, this selection is completely representative based on some measure of skill or, or whatnot, that's when you would then go in and say, okay, the original error has been reduced. Now, reducing the original error does not necessarily mean you reduce the original problem, um, but it is a measure to see some amount of progress. Um, and, and 
people in, that know about it uh, just in, in the audience. For instance, normalization of an error does not remove an error, it just left shifts it, not. Um, but it, it's a way to see, as was both your question, Fias and Sean's originally, is it doing better? Well, do the same test you did originally when you found the problem and see if it's been reduced. Now, if it has been zero, that doesn't mean you have solved the problem, but it's a good initial indicator. We have time for one more question. I mean, we, I think in a lot of ways, you know, earlier we talked about how um, people don't actually understand uh, algorithms and people don't understand AI and people don't understand how this all of this works. And um, uh, in our pre-chat, Anthony, I remember talking to you about uh, Karthik Hosnagar, who wrote that book, um, A Human's Guide to Machine Intelligence. And he wanted uh, the USA and then the rest of the world to create this algorithm bill of rights, which was going to create transparency for the end user so that people know what data um, is being used to affect them and, and any factors that they need to consider. I mean, um, is that something that you support as an idea because i feel personally that that actually would help people understand more about algorithms and about ai because then it becomes part of their daily life because it's you know it's in legislation yeah no i i fully you know, i fully support the ability for citizens individuals to be able to contact the company and say how did you make this decision about me or even what decisions have you made about me you know the, the data protection act um, GDPR, et cetera, already covers a lot of that. Um, it needs, the people who write those things need to be trained on, on the technology and the technology is moving very quickly. That's always the difficulty. But it's the same in the financial markets with the financial service ombudsman. Yeah, people will find new ways of doing models. Um, regulators will find ways of understanding them and, and dampening them back down again. But I absolutely do believe that um, any ethical Data or AI company needs to have a mechanism where anyone, even if it's a even if it's a goodwilled group, can ask, "How did you make those decisions? How do you go about them?" and actually have some independent oversight. to get companies to um, to do that. Um, I think in any in any company there will always be a, uh, a financial pressure and a doing good pressure. And we need to align those two so that the financial rewards of an organization are by being seen and doing better. Yeah. And actually, there are a lot of investment groups that are now just investing on that basis. Um, and I think that will lead people. Anything? Oh, yes, anyone? You were the final comment, Arthur, so with the primacy effect means they'll remember you better. And then forgive me for taking the floor. And uh, I just wanted to, to, to briefly mention to the... Uh, everyone here that I, I think automatic uh, insurances and automatic uh, loan schemes is a thing that's been around since the 80s. I have a problem with them being automatic because there's so many factors they cannot factor in about the individuals. One needs to first consider one's problem one has with those before factoring in the problems one has with throwing an AI on top and see if it's the AI one has an issue with, because I have a problem with it being automated in this first place in various different ways. And I just want to make sure that the audience from, if, if my one penny's worth to the audience, always think, do you have a problem with the automation or the problem with the scope of data factored in? Anyways, uh, Arthur, sorry for taking the floor again. No, not at all. I, I was actually gonna say that I think uh, both you, Nemo, and Anthony, you're CEOs at tech companies, and I think it's entirely appropriate that you answer this question because you've got a lot more uh, sort of, you know, firsthand experience of the, um, the, the sort of the, the dynamics that come into play there. I would like to actually add another element to that because I, I do think you've covered most of what I would say in terms of regulation. Um, but so a lot of conversations also evolving into developing an ethics of care, right? And I'm sure you've all heard of this idea of having a... a, a one, uh, Socratic oath for data scientists and, and things like that. Um, so I'm currently teaching um, a, an introduction to data science. I've taught an introduction to the data science course, and I also teach a data, data ethics and governance uh, module here at the University of Exeter. And one of the big things that we try and get in, and this is not at the regulation level, but at the sort of skill pool level, is that the next generation of data scientists, uh, I think, really ought to be aware, and I think they are increasingly becoming aware, 
of the context that work that their work takes place within the position of privilege that you occupy as a person who can who can manipulate data and who can present data etc cetera, etc cetera, who can develop algorithms and who can who can have this be implemented in, in certain processes these are incredibly value laden processes that take a lot of individual reflection on you your role what you think ought to be in society what you value um and so I think this is really, um, aside from, of course, uh, top-down regulation, something that we really will see developing in the future is as data science, whatever that is, becomes solidified as a discipline. It'll start being accompanied with certain expectations of the data science uh, skill set. And that is going to increasingly also include a, a data in context, an ethics component, as we start seeing you know, people who are trained and specifically applying novel data sources to societal things right as we start seeing people do that much more than say for example physics postdocs going into a lucrative um you know data science role and so this is really i think a, 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 a an interesting dynamic to think about as we move into the future and we see data science become an increasingly um sort of you know certified discipline one final thought from anthony um so we may be ceos of, of companies but we are moving very quickly and we do need outside support to make sure we're doing the right thing. That's all I'd say. Never assume. Yeah, I've worked in, in software for 30 odd years and people do not spend enough time on user experience and testing software with users. So, again, we need to do exactly the same with AI. We need groups outside who can help us explore it and make sure we're doing the right thing. Nemo. <laughs> the exact same thing, but with a quote. Which the spectator sees more of the game. Uh, so uh, keep on going. <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much. I think we could have gone on for about an hour more, but we, alas, have run out of time. So uh, I think probably next time what we should talk about is, or what we should look into is where are the science degrees with proper ethics involved in them? And then when we move forward, you know, in 10 years, uh, scientists will have those ethics uh, degrees as well as um, their normal science degrees. So Dan just says, yeah, go to the networking zone. All you have to do is click on the left of your screen and uh, get someone to link with. Thank you so much for being part of the discussion. I've had a lot of fun. I hope you have had too. So bye, guys. Everyone. Bye.